Good morning, students. Welcome back to the second semester for Financial Accounting 2 and your other subjects. As you can see, uh, the, the surroundings uh, behind me look a little bit different from the last number of classes. Uh, this time, I'm hosting it from the Wellington site, as you know. So I'll pretend that I'm in Wellington, but I'm actually just in a different room uh, within the house. Uh, some of you have been attending the, uh, the, the winter school, so welcome back to you. Some of you have had a little bit of a break. Welcome back to you as well. I uh, hope you are all refreshed and ready for this uh, quite demanding and, and hopefully also very exciting semester. Now, <clears throat> what I'd like to do uh, today, and by the way, Mr. Borman and Mrs. Moore are also with us. Uh, so all the financial accounting two lecturers are are present in this session. Uh, if you want to type any questions in the question box, you're most welcome. Um, they will answer it for you. Uh, then uh, if you need to ask a question later on personally, then we will uh, give you time that you can raise your hands uh, and that you can ask the questions. Now, the purpose of our first class uh, today is firstly to, to lay the foundation of the basic principles that we are going to be dealing with in property, plant and equipment. So the idea is to cover three, possibly four uh, topics in, in, in today's class. What I'd like us to do, first of all, is to establish the way in which we are going to create the names of our various general ledger accounts that deal with property, plant and equipment. Then I'd also like us to look at the definition of property, plant and equipment. We're also going to see how that definition fits in with some other definitions that we found uh, in the conceptual framework. So we'll get the link there. Uh, and then thirdly, I want us to, to discuss today uh, how do we establish the cost of property, plant and equipment. So those are the three things that we'd like to discuss as a minimum. Possibly, if we have a bit of time remaining uh, before before one o'clock, we're also going to start talking about depreciation and a new animal that you haven't heard of before, probably something called an impairment loss. So that is the idea for today. Like I say, the first three we, we should like to, to do today at the very least, uh, and perhaps we'll get to the fourth topic as well. Now, why we uh, why it is so important to establish a protocol or a or a or a, or a how else can we call it maybe a, a a convention that is perhaps a better term a convention on how we are going to name our general ledger accounts is that we do not become confused later on down the line in a few years time when we are carrying balances forward from the one year to the next uh, then we should still know what they all relate to. Now, in financial accounting one, you have learned about the cost of assets. You have learned about accumulated depreciation as well as depreciation. But as you know, in financial accounting one, you mostly dealt with smaller entities, um, sole traders or partnerships, close corporations. But now in financial accounting two, we are dealing with larger companies, right? Big companies. So the first thing that we need to realize here is that you're not only going to have one asset, right? You are probably going to be owning hundreds of assets, if not thousands. And for each of those assets, you will have to have an account that contains the cost of the asset, which we'll determine later on, but also an account that contains the accumulated depreciation for that particular asset, right? Um, later on today or later on this week, we'll also talk about impairment losses. Then we'll see we might even get an account called in accumulated impairment losses or a combination of those two accounts, which we then refer to as accumulated depreciation and impairment losses. But the first thing we've got to realize here is that we do not have one cost account and one accumulated depreciation account. We've got hundreds, like we said, or possibly even thousands of them, right? So we need to keep them separate. 
So as a starting point this morning, I want us to establish a protocol or a convention um, on how we are going to create the names of those accounts, that we do not become confused next year and the year after and as we carry on along the years. So I'm going to uh, share a little whiteboard here, and then I'm going to give you an indication of exactly how we are going to create names for those accounts. I know this doesn't come from uh, IAS 16, P uh, property plant and equipment deals uh, 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 is covered by IAS 16, International Accounting Standard number 16. And by the way, especially nowadays with, with uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, don't just write PPE in your financial statements because we know nowadays PPE also means personal protection equipment, right? And we are not dealing with personal protection equipment, we are dealing with property plant and equipment, so please write that out. Okay, so what we are going to do, ladies and gentlemen, when we, when we create names for our accounts, and like I said, this doesn't come from IAS 16, this is a practical necessity. This is actually the way it happens in practice as well. So, because we've got many cost accounts, we cannot just call it cost, <laughs> okay. Because we've got many accumulated depreciation accounts, we cannot simply call it accumulated depreciation. So, the protocol that we are going to, to use is to start with the name of the overall asset. I'm going to type that here. Name of the overall asset, right? So that is where we're going to start. Now, when I say overall asset, there is one thing that we must realize, uh, and that is with, with, the, with the adaptation of IAS 16 in 2005, I think it was. IAS 16 also makes provision, uh, I meant IAS 16. IAS 16 also makes provision for something we refer to as uh, significant parts. Or, um, we'll, we'll discuss that a little bit later. So what we mean, uh, mean with the name of the overall asset, if it's, for instance, smaller value assets, such as, um, let's say, various kinds of, of, of um, what can I use it as an example? Various kinds of office equipment. Office is, equipment is probably a good example. Things like your, your copiers and your printers and your computers and so forth, uh, you may find that they are relatively low in value, relatively they're still fairly expensive, uh, but that you, can, that you can rather group them together in an asset category. So you'll call that category your um, office equipment, right? Similar with ordinary motor vehicles. If you've got a, a little fleet of motor vehicles, then you'll have an, uh, 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 a category of non-current asset, part of your property, plant and equipment that you'll then call motor vehicles and so forth. But for each of those individual assets that act, actually have a significant value, like a motor vehicle, you'll have a cost account for that specific motor vehicle, right? So let's say this is motor vehicle, Volkswagen, City Golf, Sport, <coughs> and its registration number is CY1234. Then you'll have the name of the overall asset, let's say motor CY1234. And then, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have a little colon, dot, dot, right? So we're going to add a colon there. I hope you can see the colon. Perhaps somebody can just tell me because I can't see it myself. <laughs> It looks like it is there. Okay. Then, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> let's maybe now talk about the, the, the issue of a significant part. What is a significant part? And I'd like you to, to participate here with me. Uh, you can either unmute your microphone and say something, or you can type it in the, in, in the chat box. Let's start with a small kind of asset, and then we're going to build towards bigger kinds of assets. Let's say you've got a bicycle, right? So you've got a bicycle. Now, if that bicycle has got a flat tire, it's punctured, right? 
the tire is flat it's punctured you see that you cannot repair it what are you going to do are you going to replace the whole bicycle or are you only going to re replace the tire if somebody can just type for me there oh bicycle or tire Thank you, Nomi. There's a lot of very quick uh, answers. Thank you, Kristen Miller. Thank you, Bradley Bizwapi. Bizwapi, and uh, I remember you from the winter school as well. Yes, you're only going to replace the tire. It will be silly to discard the whole, the whole uh, 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 bicycle just because you are you had a flat tire. Right, so you only, thank you, Mbuyuzi. Lots of people. You're only going to replace the 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 tire. Okay, so let's go to maybe a little bit of a bigger asset. Let's say you've got a motorbike. Brum, right, you've got a motorbike, and the motorbike's battery packs up. So the motorbike's battery doesn't doesn't work anymore. Are you now going to replace the whole motorbike, or are you going to replace the battery? There we go. Thank you all so quickly, Naomi, Christian. Yes, you're only going to replace the battery. So you can see there are certain parts within these assets that has almost got a, a standalone existence, right? They can be replaced on their own. Oh, thank you, Zingisa, uh, everybody there. So you can replace that that on its own. We can take this further and further. Let's let's look maybe now at a motor vehicle. If you've got a motor vehicle and let's say the spark plugs back up, right? Uh, the spark plugs back up. In other words, there's the, the, the fuel and the spark doesn't get through. You can't start your engine. Are you going to replace your own, me own motor vehicle if the spark plug plugs back up or just the spark plugs? Yes. Cut for me. Just the plugs. Thank you. You only, thank you all. You're only going to replace the spark plugs. It'll be silly to. To, to, to replace the whole motor vehicle. Now we can go to even larger kinds of property plant and equipment, such as a, a ship or, or an aircraft, for instance. Let's maybe use the example of an aircraft. Uh, that's one of the most expensive and biggest assets that you can have. In fact, a Boeing 747, as well as uh, from, from Europe, they've got the Airbus uh, 340. They are around $55 million each to purchase, right? So it's a very expensive asset. But anyway, as we know, that aircraft consists of many different parts. It consists of engines. It consists of the wings. It consists of the tail wings. It consists of a fuselage. In other words, that tube where you go in and sit. Uh, it consists of, of the various seats, and those seats are quite high-tech nowadays because, you know, you've got a TV in front of you uh, and all sorts of things. Uh, you've got the stowing cabinets and so forth. Right. So clearly, that, ladies and gentlemen, now we can start thinking about an aircraft. And I'm going to tell you a little secret that you may not be aware of. Uh, many of the passenger aircraft in our air, I know there's not too many aircraft flying around right at this moment, but that's only because of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. But normally by now, since we started this class, I would have heard of at least five or six planes going over this house. Anyway, so most of the passenger aircraft are fairly new. So they would have been manufactured within, let's say, the last five years or so. But many of the other aircraft, especially cargo aircraft, now you're going to be surprised at what I'm saying. We're manufactured in the 1960s or 1970s. So we are talking about 50 years ago, right? So they were manufactured a heck of a long time ago. So now that sounds very scary, right? That sounds very scary. Why, why, why are these old aircraft still flying around? But I'm going to ask you a very simple question. You can just say yes or no. Do you think any single component, any single part of that aircraft that was manufactured in 1960 or 1960s or 1970s, any part is still the original part? Yes or no? Quite correct, Lili O'Neill. 
thank you very much very quick yes no those parts have been replaced many times so even that the the, the date or the year of registration and manufacture of that that aircraft might be 1974 let's say no none of the parts that they are flying over a head in the sky in that 1974 boeing or airbus is probably older than about five or six years right so it has been replaced over and over and over again right so clearly when when uh, let's say one engine if it's a boeing 747 or an airbus 340 then we know it's got four engines or if it's a boeing 727 or a 707 or a 737 which is a very popular aircraft it's got two engines right but anyway if one of those engines break are you going to replace the whole 50 million dollar aircraft or are you only going to replace that engine type for me there please yes thank you you're only going to replace the engine it'll be silly to discard the whole aircraft if only one engine has seized up right so ladies and gentlemen those various parts that can be replaced on their own that is what we refer to as significant parts. Now, not all assets will have significant parts. Thank you so much for everyone. There's a lot of, lot of answers there. Um, not all assets, but your, your larger assets, such as motor vehicles or trains or ships or aircraft, like we said, will, have, will consist of various individual significant parts. What I mean by significant parts, uh, I'm going to give you a rundown a little bit later exactly what I mean, but it is something that is substantial in value on its own, but it can also be replaced. And there's actually a third factor to it. It also has a different useful life. Now, if we think about an aircraft, an aircraft, what do you think will have the longer useful life? The, the, the fuselage? In other words, the tube, the metal tube where the passengers sit or the engines, which will last longer? The, 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 let's say the body or the engines. Exactly, Zulani. Right, so you can all see there. Thank you, Nomi. Thank you, Valile. Thank you, Sintli. Lukwaba. Yes, the body because it has less wear and tear it has less moving parts spots so the body might actually last for 15 years i'm, I'm just thumbs up sucking some figures here um, but let's say the body can last maybe 15 years but the engines because of uh, all the the friction and all of the, the 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 usage of it will probably not last more than let's say four or five years so clearly uh the, the, the fuselage or body of the aircraft has got a longer useful life than, for instance, the engines. Right. What about the wings? The wings of an aircraft, that's an interesting thing, right? Because it, they're not only wings. We do know that the wing supplies the lift or the, or the draft to, to, to descend, uh, the lift to ascend and the downdraft to descend. But it is also, they've also got all sorts of, 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 of uh, moving parts, right? Moving parts. And by the way, I don't know if you're aware of it, a lot of the gas, the fuel of the aircraft is actually stored in the wings, right? So the wings also do have moving parts. Um, for instance, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you know uh, that 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 uh, perhaps if you've, you've, you've sat in an aircraft next to the wing uh, and, and, and you, you'll see there at the back of each wing, there are flaps right flaps i don't know if you can see in that picture i'll pull in my hands it's got flaps and those flaps are the, the the mechanism that determines whether the aircraft is going to go up if it's going to ascend or whether the aircraft is going to be going down whether it's going to descend where does it all come from it comes from the lift from the air or downward pressure from the air the air surrounding us right so clearly those flaps ladies and gentlemen let's let's assume when the aircraft is not in motion the flaps uh, align perfectly with the rest of the wing but now if if the aircraft wants to take off and it has to reach a certain speed before it can take off in the case of a, a boeing 737 i think it's 350 miles per hour which is about 600 kilometers per hour 
But anyway, if they want to ascend, now I'm going to ask you a trick question. Okay. And I want you to type for me again, but listen up carefully. Those flaps at the back, if this aircraft wants to take off, it wants to lift. In other words, it wants pressure from below, from the air. Will those flaps at the back then go down or will those flaps go up? Down or up? The flaps will go down. Thank you, Zulani. That is very clever. Thank you, Anelwa, Valile, Bradley, Bizarpe, all of you. Thank you. The flaps go down. Why? Because that creates pressure from the air from below, underneath the wings. Right. And that pushes the aircraft into the air. Um, in fact, it is actually quite scary if you sit in that little window and you look at the look at the the, the, the wing. When that happens, the wing slightly lifts. Very slightly. At the edges, at, at the end, at the at the end of the wing, probably only maybe three or four or so centimeters, but it actually lifts a little bit. <laughs> okay, it lifts a little bit. So anyway, so they 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 uh, ascend and they get their their cruising altitude of let's say ten thousand meters, ten kilometers up in the air, thirty thirty three thousand feet, which is very high. It's as high. It's it's even higher than than Mount Everest. Mount Everest is just below ten kilometers. It's nine. 9,900 odd meters high. Now that that also quite scary. You sit there in the in in the aircraft, almost uh, at your destination, and you get sort of used to the humming of the engines. And then suddenly, the humming stops. And you think, "Oh my word, what's happened?" It's just a question that they are now going to start descending. So they don't want to accelerate or keep that that speed. They now want to decelerate. They want to it to 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 go slower so that it can uh, descend into the thicker air right but just as a matter of interest um so if they now want to go down they want to descend yes the fact that they are uh, decreasing the speed will contribute to the fact that they are going to start descending but also the flaps right so now if they want to descend will the flaps go up or will the flaps go down that for me the flaps at the at the uh, rear end of the of the wings. Yes, exactly. The flaps will now go up. Why? If the flaps go up, it gets pressure from the air from above. So that pushes the aircraft down. And if you sit there next to the wing and you look out, you see it's actually tilting a little bit lower, right? <laughs> So, ladies and gentlemen, what happens now with the wings, right? It's metal, as you know. So, when the, the aircraft ascends, the wings move a little bit upwards. It bends a little bit, slightly, but it does. Uh, and then when they start the descent, it bends again slightly, but it does downwards. Right? So, it keeps on bending every time it ascends. It bends a little bit upwards. Every time it descends, it bends a little bit downwards. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the, the, the engineers will tell you there's a, there's a thing in engineering, in, in, in metallurgic engineering specifically, that is called metal fatigue. Metal fatigue. What does it mean? Metal? Well, we know metals such as, as iron and, 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 and tin and all sorts of, of metals that are part of our periodic table. There are elements, as we've uh, spoken about a few weeks ago, <clears throat> and fatigue simply means it gets tired right it gets tired so what happens if you take a piece of, of metal let's say a little iron wire and you can type the answer for me again if you take that wire and you keep on bending it 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 what eventually happens it what what eventually happens to that piece of iron wire it breaks. Thank you, Valile. Thank you, Nelwans and Dile. Yes, it breaks. So eventually it breaks. So, ladies and gentlemen, when it comes to those wings, clearly metal fatigue can eventually cause it to break. Therefore, those aircraft must undergo regular inspections. Now, we're going to be talking about major inspections a little bit later during the course of the next three weeks. The fact is, because of, of, of the international, IATA is the body, because of international aviation 
rules and regulations. Each aircraft must undergo a major inspection at regular intervals. It all depends on, on, on the situation. Uh, it could be the regular intervals could be uh, at certain periods of time, let's say after every three months or after every six months, or very often in the case of, of aviation, it is after flight hours. So let's say after every 500 flight hours, in other words, the, the, the hours that the, the aircraft spends uh, in the air, it must undergo a major inspection, right? That is to, to keep it safe for us, for us who are going to be traveling on the passengers uh, so that we're not going to be flying in, in, in unsafe aircraft. Okay, so it undergoes major inspections and then those people, they're going to check, is there metal fatigue in the wings? Is there metal fatigue in the, in the, in the tail wing? Remember the tail wing helps with the steering. It's also got a flap, but it's a vertical flap, not a horizontal flap. So as the vertical flap goes to the left, it means the aircraft, the, the air will push the tail towards the right and the aircraft will turn to the left. Or if that flap goes to the, uh, to the right, the vertical on the tail, on the tail fin, uh, then the, the air pressure comes from the right hand side, it pushes the tail fin or the tail wing to the left hand side and the aircraft turns to the right. Right. Also it banks, which helps, uh, it banks a little bit, so it makes the, the, the turning of the, of the aircraft uh, much, much, much smoother. Right. Okay, so now we've, talked, we've spoken too much about that, it's taken up too much time. The fact remains, ladies and gentlemen, that those wings will also not have as long a useful life, let's say, as the body. It will also not have as long a useful life as, let's say, the interior fittings, the seats, which may last for maybe 20 or 30 years, who knows. But anyway, so we can see that each of those items, the wings, they cost about a million dollars each. The engines cost about one and a half million dollars each. I'm talking US dollars here, right? So are hugely expensive items, but they can be replaced individually, separately from the main part of, of, of this aircraft. And as we now can, can, can see for ourselves, they all probably have a different useful lifetime, right? So the wings will have a different useful lifetime to the engines, and they will have a different useful lifetime to, to uh, let's say, the interior fittings, and they will then have a different useful lifetime to, let's say, the electronics that, that, that uh, guide the aircraft and so forth. Right. So if you have an asset like that, then, ladies and gentlemen, the second part, now we're coming back to the, to the name of the account. The second part of the name of that account will be the name of the significant part. The name of the significant part, right? So this is all the 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 the, the name of our general ledger account, right? So we start with the name of the overall asset. In this case, it will be let's say let's say we've got a whole a whole fleet of aircraft, right? We are um, uh, uh, Comair or one of those those companies that 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 own fleets of of, of uh, aircraft, right? So the one will then be called, let's say, Airbus, uh, and then it, each, each aircraft has got an IATA individual registration number. So this will be, let's say, Airbus A23456, right? And then for each of those components, we are going to have a separate account. We're going to talk about cost and accumulated depreciation just now. But let's just say for each part, we are going to have a separate account, right? because it is significant in value, it has got a different useful lifetime, and certainly it can be replaced separately from the other parts of that uh, same aircraft, right? So we've got the name of the overall asset in this, in this case, let's say Airbus A2345, the name of the significant part, then we will have left-hand engine, or no, they don't talk about left-hand engine, they say port, the left hand side of a ship or the left hand side of an aircraft is the port side p-o-r-t so they'll have an account for the port engine they'll have one what is the what is the one called on the right hand side 
Naira, if you're tr uh, having trouble hearing me, it's probably because you've got a slow connection. I don't know whether anybody else has trouble hearing me. So what do you call the right-hand side engine? What is the right-hand side of a ship or an aircraft? It's called, it's actually pronounced very differently to what it's spelled. It's called the starboard side. Starboard, but it's actually spelled starboard. S-T-A-R-B-O-A-R-D. So you've got the port on the left-hand side if you're facing forward, and the starboard side. So you've got a port engine, and you've got a starboard engine. If it's a Boeing 747 or an Airbus 340, then it's got four engines. Then you've got port engine one and port engine two, and you've got port engine one and starboard engine two. <laughs> so they each have a name and they each need a different account. The first part of the account will still be that aircraft, right? Because those four engines belong to that specific aircraft. So it's still the Airbus A1234, whatever the, the name of that aircraft is and then we have the name of the significant part so we'll have an account for starboard engine one we we'll have an account for starboard engine two and an account for starboard uh, for port engine one and for port engine two we'll have an account for uh, a, a significant for the left wing and the right wing and the tail wing and uh, the interior fittings and so forth right so you get the picture right so we first have the name of the overall asset colon the name of the significant part, then another colon, ladies and gentlemen, if you can hopefully see it there. I'm not sure whether you can. And then, thirdly, we are going to describe what the account contains. So let me type that there. The thirdly, account contains. Right. So what does the account contain when we acquire that, that particular aircraft? It'll contain the cost of it, right? So uh, if we're talking about the cost of, let's say, starboard engine one, uh, we'll have an account called name of the overall asset, which is our, uh, what did we say? Was it a Boeing? No, it was a, a Airbus. And the, the series number or, the, or its individual registration number is A2345, colon, Name of the second part, starboard engine one. Colon, and what does this account contain? Type for me, type for me. What does this account contain? The I'm all yes. The cost, right? The cost that they determine. Thank you there. Thank you, Taryn. Thank you, Linwok Lukwaba. Yes, it contains the cost of that item, right? So for each significant part of that overall asset, we'll have a different account that contains the cost. Thank you, Sipukazi. Yes, so it'll contain the cost. Clearly, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to depreciate, let's say, the, the engines over a shorter period of time than, for instance, the wings. And, we, and, and, and both of those will be depreciated of, uh, over a shorter period of time then the hull or the main body or the fuselage of, of, of that aircraft, right? So therefore, that is why we keep the cost and especially the acute depreciation in separate accounts. So now we will have exactly the same situation at the end of the year when we are going to calculate the depreciation on the aircraft, that specific aircraft. It means we'll have to calculate it individually for each significant part. So that the sum of the depreciation for each significant part, the sum of those depreciation will be your depreciation for the year on that overall asset, which is the specific aircraft that we are talking about. Right. So in other words, we are going to be debiting an account called depreciation, which is the expense account. In practice, what happens, ladies and gentlemen, for each category of asset, we are going to disclose in our profit before tax note uh, the depreciation of each category of asset separately. So in practice, what the, the account that we will be debiting would be depreciation, then not a colon, because if it's a colon, it tends to indicate an asset account or something that has to do as an asset. But this is an expense. So then we'll say depreciation, dash, and then the category of assets, which in this case will be aircraft right not a specific individual aircraft 
but all the aircraft in our fleet of aircraft right this is quite important to note so it's depreciation the expense which is going to be closed off at the end of the year we have a little dash and then the category of asset in this case a category of property plant and equipment which is our aircraft but for each significant part we'll have to have a separate and individual accumulated depreciation account. depreciation not the expense but the accumulated depreciation remember the depreciation expense account gets written off at the end of the year it is shown under your uh, uh, cost functions right so it is going to be uh, starting afresh the new year with a zero balance but in the case of your balance sheet accounts such as the cost of the asset and the accumulated depreciation of the asset as we'll see later on also accumulated impairment losses they get balanced off not closed off balanced off at the end of the year which means that those balances get carried forward to the next year and again to the next year after that and again to the next year after that right so you might have for the body of the of the uh, uh, the, the the aircraft you might have the, the the accumulated depreciation and cost being carried forward for the next 15 years or so so anyway just to complete this argument um so your accumulated depreciation the name that we are going to be giving that account is going to be very similar to what we've typed there but i'm going to type it now once so it'll again be the name of the overall asset i'm just going to type it in one line now so you can you cannot see what i'm typing until i finish typing it but uh, you'll see it soon i'm just going to type the whole name of the account now so the name of the overall asset colon then the name of as you know already now of the significant part colon and then thirdly what does the account contain and in this case i don't, don't want you to top it you can i know you can but it's a long long little sentence what does this account contain now the accumulated depreciation so that'll be the name of our account voila now you should be able to see what i've typed right so that account in the case of of, of the, the, the the let's say the starboard engine one will be the name of the overall asset which is uh, airbus registration a2345 name of the significant part it is starboard engine one and then thirdly after that colon what does this account now contain it contains accumulated depreciation right okay i know this was quite a long story but it is important ladies and gentlemen uh, that you do not simply call your account accumulated depreciation because that means nothing if you have a, a company that has got hundreds or like we said uh, even thousands of assets De accumulated depreciation on what you may know this year you may know next year but you may have forgotten by in, in five or six years time, or you may retire in five years times and a new accountant comes into your place and he or she says oh my word here i see 300 accumulated depreciation accounts but i don't know what they are referring to which asset do they relate to right then that accountant is a little bit lost so that is why we have this this uh, uh call or this convention of calling the 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 accounts that deal with the value with the carrying amount of the asset in other words the cost the accumulated depreciation and the accumulated impairment losses in separate accounts for each asset overall or category of asset and then if that asset has got significant parts then we also have that that middle part uh, for the account name okay let us pause there now i'm almost out of breath <laughs> sorry i do get a little bit over enthusiastic sometimes so let's pause there for a, for a little while and see whether there are any questions from your side if you want to ask the question in the uh, text box or if you want to raise your hand and ask it personally you are most welcome 
I'm going to disappear from the screen for a few seconds and you can uh, ask your questions. I'm still here though, I'm just not on the screen. So you're welcome to ask questions. Any questions? No questions from your side? Okay, so then um, I guess we've, we've got the, the uh, protocol or the way that we are going to design the, the, uh, the various ledger accounts for us pretty clear. I hope we are all uh, in, in, in uh, agreement that that is the way that we are going to be doing it. Okay, then let us go and have a look at the definitions. And we're also going to have a look at um, how it fits in with, with, the, with the conceptual framework. I'm going to share a little file here just before I share it. Maybe, maybe I'll just talk about uh, it again. So let us just talk in general. We, we uh, now you will end the, the winter school over the last two weeks. You'll know that we spoke about the conceptual framework in the first of the two weeks. Those of you who already had these classes during the first term, let me refresh your memories. Uh, we, we have the conceptual framework that forms the foundation of the various standards for financial reporting. Uh, and we, we see there in the conceptual framework that it provides us, let me just see this um, chat. Uh, we see that it provides us for Valila, I'm going to answer your question just now. Let me, uh, I've started with this argument, so let me just finish that quickly. Um, so we saw there that, that the elements in the financial statements are defined. So they define the element and asset. They define the element a liability. They define income, expense, equity, and so forth, right? But now you've got the further standards once you have determined in accordance with the conceptual framework that, that an item is an asset, then you've got to use the other fun, uh, uh, financial reporting standards to determine which kind of asset it is in particular. Or if you have seen that in terms of the conceptual framework, something is defined as a liability, then you have to use the, the subsequent standards, the standards that follow on that to determine which type of liability does it refer to. Therefore, in the other subsequent standards, we've got further definitions. So we use the five definitions for, for the elements in our conceptual framework to determine simply which kind of element it is. Is it an asset? Is it a liability? Is it income? Is it an expense? Is it equity? Right. But then we've still got to find out and determine what kind of asset or what kind of liability, right? So therefore, we've got various standards. We've got a standard that deals with uh, uh, inventory, that is IAS2. We've got a standard that deals with uh, uh, intangible assets. I think that's IAS 36, if I'm, no, no, 39, I think. And we've got the standard that we're going to start working on now, which is IAS 16, which deals with property, plant, and equipment. So therefore, we've got to go and refer to all of those other additional or supplementary definitions to see what kind of an asset is this. Is this now property, plant and equipment? Or is it inventory? Or is it an intangible asset? Is it a biological asset, uh, for instance, in terms of that standard that deals with agriculture? Uh, is it a financial asset? So we need to know those definitions so that we can determine which kind of asset this is. Right, so let's go there. I'm going to just provide you with, with
I'm so sorry. I think I switched off my microphone there. <laughs> I've been talking a lot, but my microphone was off. I'm sorry. I was answering Valile's question here. Uh, Valile said, under which account, uh, uh, under what account con contains? Uh, it only talks about the cost. No. Uh, if you can still see my whiteboard, when you originally recognized the acquisition, of that that asset right if you recognize the acquisition uh, then you would have had the name of the overall asset the name of the significant part and then what the account contains would then be the cost but then subsequently to the acquisition of that asset uh, at the at the end of each financial year or at each reporting date you have to have what they refer to as subsequent measurement the subsequent measurement is the carrying amount of that asset at that particular point in time when you do the uh, uh, financial statements, when you report on the financial position. So then you are going to calculate your depreciation and you're going to credit that account that you are going to, to, to carry the, the accumulated depreciation forward. So therefore, uh, uh, Belile, there's also an account that, that, that is the contra to the cost. And that will be the name of the overall asset, such as a particular aircraft, the name of the significant part, like the specific engine. But then what does the account contain in that case? Not the cost. Then it contains the accumulated depreciation. Valile, does that answer your, your question there? So... You're welcome. Right. So if it's a debit, it will contain the cost of the asset. Then uh, in the case of the contra accounts, it would contain the accumulated depreciation. And as we'll see later this week or possibly next week, it could also contain something we call the accumulated impairment losses. Okay. Now, I'm not 100 percent sure where I accidentally switched off my microphone. So uh, hopefully you didn't miss out too much. But I was going to say that we are now going to look at the, the definition first of an asset, which you already know. You've already, uh, uh, when we did the, the conceptual framework, you know exactly what is meant by that. So let's just revise that quickly. Um, so first of all, for something to be, to be property plant and equipment before it can be property plant and equipment, it must first be an asset as defined in the conceptual framework, right? So you know what that definition is. It must be a present economic resource controlled by the entity resulting from past events. And we spoke about that two weeks ago, as well as at the beginning of the year, what each of it means. Uh, the framework itself tells us that an economic resource is defined as a right. We spoke about right obligations a few weeks ago uh, that has the potential to produce economic benefits, right? So once we've decided that this item does qualify as an asset in terms of, in terms of this definition, we must now go and determine which further kind of asset is it. Is it a financial asset? Is it a logical asset? Uh, is it an intangible asset? Is it property, plant, and equipment? So we'll have to go and look at the definitions contained in those reporting, international financial reporting standards that contain uh, the definitions for them. So let's assume that we start with property, plant, and equipment definition because that's the one we're going to be dealing with now. Okay, so once we've determined that it's an asset, we must go further and look at the definition of property, plant, and equipment as contained in IAS 1. Okay, I'm just going to go through this definition initially, and then we're going to discuss the components of it. Okay, so simply simply put, IAS 16 says that property, plant, and equipment is defined as a, as a tangible item which is which uh, are held or which is held for use or used, which are held or used or for use. Uh, in the production or supply of goods or services for rental to others for administration purposes and are expected to be used during more than one period right so that is the the, the definition so now let's go and analyze that let's go and look at each individual 
little uh, a sentence or, or even phrase here. First of all, the first component of the definition is that it must be a tangible item. So what does tangible mean? What does tangible mean? Anybody wants to make a little educated guess there? Uh, let me just get to the text box again. Sorry, I'm now in a different area. Physical, there we go. We can touch it. Exactly. Laura, you've got it right, Bradley. It's, in other words, we can do this. I don't know if you'll be able to hear it, but hopefully. Right, you can feel it, you can touch it, you can kick it, you can lick it. Right, so it has physical substance. We can touch it, we can see it. Like Zandile also said, we must be able to touch and feel it. Touchable, physical, something you can touch. Thank you all. So that is what is meant by a tangible item. So there already, it excludes something like a financial asset, which is not a physical item. There already, it excludes something uh, like for instance, uh, 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 intangible assets, right? Because they have got no physical form. Then their definition goes further and it says that item, which we now know is tangible, it has physical form, we can see it, we can feel it, and so forth. Uh, it must be used for either one of the following three purposes, right? That's all three. It must be a, it must be used for one of the following three possibilities so let's look at the three possibilities and then we also at the same time uh, we will we'll provide or you will provide for us examples so it must be held or used in the production or supply of goods or services in the production or supply of goods or services so let's perhaps think about a typical a typical property plant and equipment item that will be used in the production of goods. What would a typical category be that is used in the production of goods? Got for me an answer there. Machine, quite correct, Kristen. You don't even need a question mark. You're 100% spot on YouTube, Lila. Something like machinery or plant, right? They are used in the production of the goods that the company manufactures that they are going to eventually sell. Let's maybe think of an item that is used in the production or supply of services. I don't know whether you can see me uh, uh, yet. If you can't, doesn't matter. But I had one of those on Saturday, two days ago. <laughs> I, I, I underwent one of those services. I had a haircut. <laughs> okay. I had a haircut, thank you very much, to my daughter. She did a haircut on me. So those the equipment that you use to provide services, such as your, your clippers, your electronic clippers, or your 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 brushes and, and, and scissors that's all equipment that you use to provide the hairdressing service right so all of them will qualify as property plant in equipment uh, because they are used to produce an item or to produce a service it goes further besides that or for rental to others what would be a typical item that is being rented, let's say, by Avis or Europe Car or Hertz? Land and buildings are also very good, good examples, right? So if you simply own the land and buildings in order to rent it out to someone else, that means that building will qualify as property, plant and equipment. Or if you own a fleet of motor vehicles such as Avis or Europe Car or Hertz, uh, then your intention is to use those motor vehicles to rent out to others. So your revenue will be coming from the rental of, 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 of your motor vehicles. Thank you, Terry. Uh, yes, the motor cars, uh, 
that that will that will then be your property plant and equipment because you are renting those motor vehicles out to to others right or the third possibility it can be held for administration purposes so in other words it doesn't produce your product or your service you do not rent it out but it is essential in order to 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 run the company manage the company so for administration purposes Perhaps you can type one or two or three examples for me there. Office equipment, fantastic example. Thank you, Nomi. Something like office equipment, your printers and copiers and uh, 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 um, computer equipment and laptops and those kind of things. Anything you need to be able to run the company, right? Station, uh, stationary, Bradley, yes. Stationary, um, if, if the stationary is going to last you, I'm going to tell you a little story now uh, about the stationary. Yes, I agree with stationary, but only if that stationary is still on hand at the end of the year, right? So that is, that is, that is quite true, uh, but not the stationary that you have consumed already. So we'll, we'll talk about that just now in the last part of this uh, uh, definition. Okay, so we've got the, the three types of, of functions that it has, right? either production or, uh, or supply of good services, or for rental to others, or for administration purposes. But then we mustn't forget the third component. It says it must be expected to be used during more than one period. Now, let me start already by giving you a little warning here ladies and gentlemen it does not say do more than yeah right we have to be clear on that it doesn't necessarily uh, have to be used during more than one year what that period refers to is a financial accounting period right so i'm going to use bradley biswapi's example as well just now but let's maybe think about a, a few scenarios. Let's say this is a machine, right? This machine uh, manufactures something, but it has got a very short, useful life. Let's say, for instance, I'm going to give you a few scenarios now. Uh, let's say your financial uh, accounting period, your financial year, in other words, ends on the 31st of December every year, right? And you purchase one of these items one of these machines that are going to last you nine months you purchase it right at the beginning of the financial year which is the first of january and we know it's only got an expected useful lifetime of nine months so at the end of no, uh, uh, september it'll have no further value for us no further value in use would that then would that then be part of your PP definition or not is it going to be used during more than one accounting period yes or no exactly no. the answer is no thank you Zandile yes so I mean the answer is no I'm saying yes you are correct the answer is no uh, so clearly it's not going to be used during more than one accounting period the full useful life, it, 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 its value in use to you is going to be consumed during that financial year. Now let's go to this further little scenario. Then, remember this is now at the end of September. Now you've got to replace that machine with another machine. So on the 1st of October, you replace it with a new machine, right? And that machine is again going to last you it's going to have a useful life of nine months, same as the previous one, right? So it means it's now going to have a useful life for us from the beginning of October until the end of June next year. So even though it has a useful life, just like the first one of only nine months, less than a year, but now in this case, does it comply with the definition of PPE or not? Yes or no? What would you say? Yes, quite correct, Taryn. Quite correct, Valile. Yes, now it does. Why? It's still only useful for nine months, but now the usefulness of that asset, it is useful for the last three months of this financial year, the current financial year. But then it still has value for us. We're still going to be using it 
for the first six months next year as well right so therefore it is expected to be used during more than one accounting period it's going to be used for three months during this year and it's going to be used for a further six months next year so the value it's going to be due to be uh, losing in other words the depreciation it will be depreciated by three over nine months one third during the course of this year but two thirds of it, its value in use still exists at the end of this financial year. We cannot simply write it off as an expense. Now it has to be capitalized. And then it does fall part of the definition of property, plant, and equipment. Right. Let me go back to, to uh, Bradley's uh, uh, point. Uh, it's, it's way up somewhere. He mentioned stationary. Yes. So Bradley, quite correct. If you purchase stationery to the value of, let's say, 1,000 rands during the course of the year, but then you still have part of that stationery, let's say half of it. At the end of the year, it means it is still going to have economic benefits for you next year. So in that case, it will uh, be part of your of your uh, uh, assets. But now there's one problem with with your with your stationery. And we're going to get back to 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 uh, uh, to that a little bit later. The stationery, when it comes to to current and non-current, uh, will will your stationery normally be used for for multiple years, or will it normally just be used this and and perhaps have a, a, some of it left next year, or for use next year? Uh, it is really going to be that stationary is going to have multiple years of usefulness. So therefore, it would rather be shown as a current asset, right? If it is a current, uh, uh, if you have some stationary on hand at the end of the year, you are going to be using that up within 12 months. Uh, sorry, I just lost my, my video there, I think, for a second. Hopefully, you, you, I'm back with you. Uh, so, therefore, because the, the stationery does not have a non-current uh, uh, um, attribute, it means it will rather be shown not as property, plant, and equipment, but as inventory, simply because it is going to be used within one year after the financial year. And you'll still you'll remember that distinction we spoke about recently about current and non-current so your, your stationary will not be a non-current asset right it'll be a current asset okay ladies and gentlemen um so we know what the definition is now we know that we've got a protocol on how we are going to determine the names of our various ledger accounts okay so let's pause there and let's see if there are any questions from your side we had one question uh, just uh, about 10 or 12 or 15 minutes ago, which we have answered. Is there any other questions from your side? You can either type it or you can ask it in person if you wish. I'd like to hear from you. No questions. Okay. Now, ladies and gentlemen, um, if there are no questions, let's talk about the third thing that, that we want to discuss today, and that is how we determine the cost of property, plant, and equipment. Now, you can make a few notes. Uh, it is in your textbook. Um, Mr. Borman uh, has written a, a fantastic uh, uh, lesson or, or document that will also guide you through everything that we are uh, talking about in class. But perhaps you can uh, make a note now there as well so that you have it, you know, in your notebook and ready uh, at hand. How is the initial cost? The, the, the textbook as well as IAS 16 talks about various periods or, or stages of measurement. Measurement initially, in other words, when you acquire the asset and then measurement subsequently. Subsequently means they're after, such as at every reporting date when you when you draw up the financial statements and so forth okay so let us start there if you have got a pen and pencil andy and you have got a notebook or a piece of paper andy when it comes to the cost 
the cost of property, plant, and equipment, there are basically three components to it. The first component is the purchase price. We're going to talk about that a little bit. Well, each of them we're going to define and, and talk about a lot later. But let's just get to the three components. First of all, the purchase price. Purchase price. Then secondly, directly attributable cost. Do you want me to type it for you? Maybe I can do that. So our components there, first of all, purchase price. Right, so that's our first component, what makes up the cost of this property, plant and equipment. The second component that must be added uh, to the purchase price in order to determine the cost of the asset is what is referred to as directly directly attributable cost directly attributable cost and then there's this a third component that relates to to property plant and equipment it doesn't relate to any other non-current asset uh, we'll see the reason why later on it is called certain and the the emphasis is on the word certain certain future cost certain future cost now perhaps we can just talk about the certain what does the certain mean certain future future cost can be it is quite ambiguous it can be interpreted in two ways certain may may mean some uh, or certain may mean i am pretty sure about it and the correct interpretation is the second one right so when they talk about certain future cost it doesn't mean ooh, i don't know really which but some sort of uh, future cost no what it means it is certain you are certainly going to incur the cost in future so you are a hundred percent positive that that future cost will be incurred right uh, like i said we'll talk about that a little bit later so now let's maybe just talk about what does each one of them mean the purchase price ladies and gentlemen um i'm going to i'm going to simplify it a little bit but i'd like you to make a note again because it really is what it comes down to. The purchase price is what you pay for that item or what you are going to pay for that item if you should pay it cash, right? So if you actually pay it cash, if you, if you do the payment on the same day of, of acquisition, the purchase price will simply be what you pay for it. If you are going to purchase it on credit, it will be what you are going to pay for that item when you are going to pay for the item, right? Uh, if, you, if you are going to pay in 30 days time or 60 days time, what you are going to be paying for the item. But it does not include the cost of extended financing. So if you are going to enter into a finance lease or, a, or a, an installment a sale agreement where you have to pay a, a, a finance cost, on the purchase price it does not include the finance cost right so it is simply what you are going to be paying for that asset if you should pay it today that is really what the purchase price is even if you pay in 30 days time right all happy with what is meant by by uh, the purchase price if somebody can just type for me there you're happy you know what is purchase price it's basically what you're going to be paying for it happy with that Thank you very much. Then the matter of directly attributable cost. Directly attributable cost is, is defined in IAS 16, which we are dealing with now. It is uh, defined in IAS 2, just as another example that deals with inventory. It's also defined in the IAS, I think it's IAS 39, that deals with intangible assets. It's actually defined in quite a number of standards that deal with, with the measurement of assets. Please make a note again, ladies and gentlemen. Perhaps I can type it, but it's quite a long story. But if, if you have to if you have to write it, I'm sure I can type it. <laughs> okay. So directly attributable cost is a cost that is necessarily incurred. 
So I'm going to, you're only going to see what I'm type, what I've typed once I've finished typing it. But please write it down as I'm saying it. So it's a cost that is necessarily incurred. Okay. So a cost that is necessarily incurred. We're going to discuss what all of this means a little bit later. Uh, so a cost that is necessarily incurred to bring the asset to a condition to bring the asset to a condition or location a location where it can be used as management intents. Right, so there we've got a nice little definition for directly attributable cost. So it's a cost necessarily incurred to bring the asset to a condition or location where it can be used as management intents. Now, what is management management's intention? Let's maybe talk about that as well. Like I say, this similar definition appears in IAS2, which deals with inventories. So in the case of IAS2, which deals with inventories, what does management intend to do with that asset? They intend to buy it and then resell it. So their intention is to get it in a condition or a location where they can resell it. That's what why we, we, we had in financial accounting one something like transport inwards is part of the cost of the inventory right because it needs to it needs to be on your premises in your shop in order to sell it so that it can be used as management intents but in our uh, in our circumstances where we are dealing with property plant and equipment ias 16 what is the intention of management well we'll have to see it might be that they are going to install uh, uh, plant and equipment in their factory in which case that installation cost will be part of the cost of the asset or, or whatever intention as long as it's uh, uh, it can then be used as management intents or if it's motor vehicles uh, let's say delivery vehicles obviously the delivery vehicles must be at your premises and it must be in working condition right so let's go and analyze it from the start First of all, it says that definition of what is a directly attributable cost. It says that it is a cost that is necessarily incurred. Right. Let's pause there. What does that mean? It means the cost must be necessary. Right. First and foremost, the cost must be necessary. You can't do without incurring the cost. You cannot get that asset uh to to a place or con or condition where manage can management can use it as they need to without incurring the cost so it's a necessary cost it's not a luxury right we cannot do without incurring the cost so that is the first prerequisite for it to be classified as a directly attributable cost then ladies and gentlemen it must be it must have an effect in one of two ways on the asset itself and it is quite important that you realize we're talking about the asset itself nothing surrounding the asset but the asset itself that necessary cost must either be incurred to bring the asset to a condition where it can be used as management intents in other words if it's plant uh, uh, or equipment or machinery that's going to be installed to manufacture a, a, a product it cannot work you cannot manufacture the product you cannot use the machine unless it is installed otherwise it's going to be like a washing machine that's unbalanced you know as the the, the drum spins is going to walk on its own right so so it has to be fixed it has to be installed or it must be in a location that cost that you have to incur it must play a role in bringing that asset to a location or a place where it can be used as management intends so again if it's for instance a plant and machinery 
if it hasn't been delivered to your factory and if, if it isn't uh, 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 physically in your factory you cannot use it to manufacture the products so not only must it be installed that it's in a condition that it can be used to manufacture the goods it must be actually there it must be in your factory so if you need to incur 50,000 rands uh, of, 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 of transport expenses to, 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 let's say, transport it from the factory where it was made or from the uh, port where you have imported to your factory, that cost is a necessary cost and it must not be written off as an expense. It must be capitalized as part of the cost of the asset because it does qualify as a directly attributable cost, right? Let's pause there. Any question on that so far? You know, do you now understand not only purchase price but also what is meant by a directly attributable cost? Yes or no? Anything I need to repeat? Can you type something for me? Thank you. Happy so far. Okay. Then just the last, the third component, uh, where they ref thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, students. Uh, let me just see. Uh, Roddy, Roddy's got a hand up. Yes, Roddy, would you like to ask something? Just remember, if you want to ask something, unmute your microphone. Roddy? Doesn't look like Roddy's got anything to say. Anyway, then certain future costs, right? That that does not form part of the definition of, of, of uh, the cost of inventory or an intangible asset. That little part is quite unique to property, plant, and equipment. We said we're going to find out the reason for that. It is because property, plant, and equipment, as part of its definition, is always a tangible asset. It is a, it is a physical asset, right? It is not like an intangible asset or a financial asset or so. So certain future costs, those are costs that you already, on the date of acquisition, you know that you will, you must incur it sometime in the future. The best example of that is, is, is um, demolition costs. Demolition costs, or, or what, is, what is another example that I can think of? Dismantling. The cost of dismantling an asset. So you have manufactured an asset, but in accordance with your agreement with someone, you also have to dismantle it at the end of its of its useful period, right? Or you have to demolish it. Um, I actually encountered one such a case just once in my more than 25 years in practice, and that was a movie studio. They 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 made a movie, the movie house. Uh, 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 had to construct uh, 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 something that looked similar to a hospital uh, and it had to be in a certain area that looks like a certain part of Africa uh, because it, it, it actually was a movie about a, a, a medical doctor in the 1900s, 1910s or, or, or so, uh, Dr. Albert Schweitzer. Uh, anyway, so there's a movie studio. So the, the place that they found that was the most appropriate to build this, uh, uh, this movie studio uh, uh, um, that will look like a hospital was in KwaZulu-Natal uh, amongst the sugar plantations. So they approached a farmer there, uh, many farmers, but one of them said, yes, you can build this set, this movie set. Uh, but remember, once you are done with shooting the movie, you have to remove the everything so that I can resume my sugar plantation there, right? So you can use it for maybe two years or how long it's going to take you to, to, to shoot the movie. But once you are done with the set, you must demolish it. Right. So anyway, uh, so, so that movie house that, that um, obviously that set was, was, was the property plant and equipment. The set was the asset which enabled them to, to, to manufacture the product, the product being the movie. Uh, so that asset, as part of the, the cost of the asset, they estimated that it's going to cost them, I can't remember the exact figures, but let's say a half a million rands to eventually demolish and remove the rubble from, from uh, the building of the set that they constructed 
only for the purposes of the movie. So the cost that they estimated that they need to incur, which, which was definitely going to have to be incurred, uh, of 500,000 rands was then capitalized as part of the cost of the of the asset which was the the, the movie studio okay so the the cost of, of of property plant and equipment consists of a purchase price what you pay for it directly attributable cost which we've discussed and then certain future costs right so now let's go and look at an example perhaps we just before we look at an example and then you're going to be doing most of the talking preferably in person, but if you want to type it, that's also okay. Let's maybe just be there for a few seconds. Um, is there any or are there any questions? <coughs> is there in the chat box or personally? Okay, so now let's go and have a look at, at uh, a typical Question: A typical uh, uh, question that deals with with uh, uh, how you determine the cost of the asset. If uh, if we have a little bit of time, then after that, uh, as possibly the 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 uh, impairment losses on it as well, or an impairment test. Let's see how far we get. Okay, so here we are going to use question number three, I think it is. Let me just go to the chat box quickly. Um, Lily, where does maintenance cost uh, for PPE fit in this uh, three in this three costs? But Lily, we are going to be talking about that um, uh, not in today's class, but in, in a future session. But perhaps we can already just mention that now. When it comes to maintenance, maintenance, we must now uh, understand what is meant by the term maintenance. If we are talking about maintenance, right? Maintenance, like Mrs. Moore has typed there, that when we are going to start talking about subsequent costs, we're now just talking about initial costs, right? So later on, when we talk about subsequent costs, costs that you incur after the acquisition of the item, then we will address that. But let's maybe give you some thoughts already. When you use the term maintenance, cost for maintaining an asset, by its very definition, that, and, and please, students, if you can type an answer for me here, does that maintenance improve the asset or just, or does it just keep it at its current usable level? Does it improve it, yes or no? Perhaps you can just type yes or no. If it's maintenance, does it improve the asset? We've got a <laughs> we've got about a 50-50 split in, 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 in opinions here, which is probably a good thing because we are going to discuss it later on. But by its very nature, maintenance means you are not extending the useful life of the asset. You are just maintaining it that the original useful life will remain as it was originally estimated. Right. So if you purchase, let's say, for, for instance, a motor vehicle, we know that it has to be serviced after every, let's say, 15,000 kilometers or after every uh, year, right? So that is regular maintenance. Therefore, you have to incur costs on that, let's say, at least annually or every 15,000 kilos. But will that extend the useful life beyond the five years or not? Yes or no? Or is it still only going to be a, have a useful life of, of five years? You're correct, Nami. So you're correct, Zandili. It's not going to extend. No, thank you. All those no's are correct. Thank you, Bradley Biswapi. It's still five years. Thank you, uh, Taryn and, and that student who just uh, has uh, entered the guest student number. So therefore, maintenance cost, if it is not going to extend the useful lifetime, it means it does not increase the future economic benefits. The future economic benefits 
that you can derive from that asset still remains the same. But you have to maintain it in order to achieve that five-year uh, uh, useful life. I mean, if you do not service a different matter, then your engine is going to seize up and you're going to have difficulties and the, the, the uh, useful lifetime will even shrink. It's going to become less. Uh, but the fact is, if it's just maintenance, it maintains the current economic or, or, or economic uh, benefits that you can generate from that, which you have ev initially estimated to be five years. So it just maintains it at five years. If you should replace, let's say after four years, you replace the engine of a motor car, right? Then that, that engine can now possibly last for another five years, right? That means you now can use that motor vehicle with a new engine for 10 years in total, right? But then it is not maintenance. Then you have replaced a significant part. Remember, we spoke about significant parts about an hour or so ago, right? Then it is a significant part that you've replaced and it increases the economic useful life of that asset, which means you are going to be able to generate more future economic benefits, right? Then it is an improvement. But anyway, so, so does that just sort of start to answer your question? Who asked it again? Let me just have a look. Oh, no, I think... Oh, thank you. There were so many, so many positive and correct answers. Um, oh, somewhere it was way up there in the chat. Right. Thank you, Belile. Of course, Belile. Thank you so much, Belile. Yes. Right. So if it's just maintenance, it's going to be in effect, not be part of the cost of the asset. So it doesn't form part of the purchase price. It's not a directly attributable cost. It is not a certain future cost because all of them relate to your initial measurement. So maintenance is what we refer to as subsequent costs. And in that case, if it doesn't improve or extend the useful life of the asset, you're going to write it off as an expense. Okay. Perfect. So now let's go and have a look at an example of calculating the cost of an asset that was uh, acquired right so i'm again going to have a, a share a little screen here if i can just find that um which one is it it is that one okay i'm going to use uh question three from the question bank um you will probably have seen that uh, only, only, only remember to do that over the weekend, but over the weekend, under your content, under the, the question banks or notes and question banks, there is now uh, uh, a few pages of, of notes that describe the basic principles of property planting equipment, uh, uh, as well as a question bank, right? It's in PDF format, but it is the content. So there are quite a number of questions in there. The one that we are going to be looking at just to illustrate how you calculate the cost of an asset is question three. So let us have a look at question three. As we've mentioned previously, very often in the case of financial accounting or auditing or cost accounting for that matter, it is a good idea to go and have a look at it quite a bit first that we can form an expectation of what is coming. So we have a question here, question three. Uh, what is required of us? First of all, 3.1, calculate the cost to be capitalized at the date of acquisition, right? So what is the cost that we must capitalize on the date of acquiring this asset? That we are going to definitely finish with today. Then 3.2 and 3.3. Three, as I said at the beginning, if we have sufficient time, we're also going to start looking at uh, depreciation and impairments, but otherwise we'll leave that till our next class. Okay, so the second part, calculate the depreciation for the year in the 31st of July, which we might get to today or might not. And 3.3, test whether the asset should be impaired. At the 31st of July 2006, I doubt whether we'll actually get there today. Uh, so I guess 3.2 and 3.3 will do a next time. But at least let us do 3.1. So now we've got to go and calculate 
uh, what is the cost of the asset that needs to be capitalized? Okay, so question three reads as follows. The following costs were incurred on plant on the 1st of February 2006. And here we see there's a whole long list of various costs that were incurred uh, in, in, on the acquisition. Then we've got some additional information here, certain auxiliary parts costing X rands and so forth, uh, forth uh, form part of the plant's purchase price. There's a lot of information, but all of that deals with uh, the depreciation uh, or the impairment test, right? So now we are just focusing on what is going to be the cost of the asset. Okay, so let's start with the first item. The first item is a purchase price. Does the purchase price form part of the cost? Yes or no? You are very quick, thank you. Yes, 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 yes. So as we know, per definition, uh, part of the definition of the cost First of all, the purchase price. So certainly the purchase price is going to form part of the cost of the asset. Now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, as you know from financial accounting one, when you did value added tax, uh, a, lot, we, a lot is now going to depend on whether this company is registered as a bad vendor or not. If this company is not registered for VAT purposes, right? Uh, if it's not a VAT vendor, it means they do not have to submit the, the, the returns every second month. They do not have to submit the VAT uh, 201 return, uh, which means if they're not registered for VAT, they've got no way of claiming the input VAT back. You've learned last year in financial accounting one about input and output VAT, right? Input VAT is the VAT that the, 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 the uh, company initially pays over to a supplier. And if the company is registered for VAT purposes, it can claim that input tax VAT back from the South African Revenue Service. So if this company is not registered for VAT purposes, then it means the VAT is not a refundable tax, right? They cannot get a refund for it. So that VAT is then truly a cost to the company and then it will form part of the cost of the asset this this plant right but if the company is registered for that purposes if they uh, if the company is a VAT vendor then it means they can claim the 14 percent VAT that they pay over to the supplier they can claim that back when they when they uh, eventually submit their their, their bi-monthly that return right so in that case the the value added tax is not a cost to the company it's not a cost to the company at all they paid over initially to the supplier but it was in two months they claim it back from the receiver of revenue or the revenue service so that means in that case if the company is registered for that purposes, you must exclude the value added tax from the cost okay so now we know uh, they, they, they state there the purchase price, including, let me just highlight that, including VAT at 14%. I know VAT is 15% now, but in 2006, it was still 14%, right? Uh, so, so obviously, if you get a question that, that deals with 2020 or 2019 financial years, the VAT would have been 15%. Anyway, so the VAT included in that 684,000 rands. So now to determine the cost excluding the VAT, what formula are you going to apply there? If you can type a little formula for me in the chat box, you're going to take that 684,000 rands, and what formula, formula are you going to apply to it to calculate the amount excluding the VAT? Just the, the, the gross purchase price then. Multiplied, let's start with one thing. Multiplied by what? Okay, let's maybe, before we do that, that 684,000, I know, 
that you that you learn this in financial accounting one there we go Nkobile. you are very quick just remember you are 100 percent correct but the, the the bat rate in this case is is 14 percent not 15 percent right if it had been 15 percent then exactly correct uh but like Taryn states there, it's and like you also said, you multiply by 100 because the, the, the gross purchase price represents a factor of 100. And then you divide it by the factor that includes the, the value added tax, which is then 114, right? So if the value added tax was 15% like it is now, like Nkobile says, then you multiply by 100 and divide by 115, right? But in this case, it's 14% because it was still 2006. So you multiply by 100, divide by 114. If somebody can tell me there, so what is our purchase price? Six hundred thousand. Thank you all. So this uh, uh, the purchase price is then six hundred thousand, which means that the value added tax. Uh, is the 84,000 that is not going to form part of the cost of this asset because we can claim it back. Uh, uh, and that will then, if, if we are going to look at some names of the accounts a little bit uh, uh, later, hopefully, if we get around to it. But it means that uh, the cost of the asset will be uh, uh, debited with 600,000 rands and capital input VAT uh, control or capital input VAT account will be debited with the 84,000. Okay, now let's go to the to 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 each of the next categories of cost. And now, ladies and gentlemen, you I want you to to again provide me with the answers here, but not not immediately. Now, let me just ask the questions. First. I want you to tell me and I'm going to provide you with a method or a reasoning or a, a logical way to go about how you are going to determine whether the the additional costs are either uh, uh, qualify in terms of directly attributable cost or a certain future cost okay so let's look at the second one import duties and they say it is non-refundable now we must ask ourselves should that be written off as an expense or should that be capitalized as part of the cost of the asset why do we have to determine that if it uh, if it does form if it does qualify in terms of the definition of a directly attributable cost it must be capitalized as part of the cost of the asset if it does not qualify as a directly attributable cost in terms of uh, the definition of it then it must be written off as an expense so the way we go about this ladies and gentlemen the very first question we are going to ask, if you remember the, the definition of, of a directly attributable cost, the first question we're going to ask is that import duties that is non-refundable, is it a necessary cost? Do you have to incur it? If you can type uh, an answer to that for me, please. Yes, Sandile, yes, Nomi. Yes, MBUC, MBUC. Yes, Rukaba, Zulani, so so quick. Yes, it's a necessary cost. You cannot go and import it uh, unless you pay the import duties. You know, in practice, what happens if you import it and it, and it and it lands with an aircraft at the airport, it goes to the customs warehouse, or if it's at a, 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 a seaport, it goes to the customs warehouse, and they they're not going to release it to you unless you pay the import duties right they first going to inspect it that it's not contraband you know that you're not importing dangerous weapons or drugs or something like that and once they see it's a legitimate product then they're going to say thank you you can come and fix it but you've got to pay me import duties first right so it is a necessary cost so it tends to 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 uh, look like a directly attributable cost but now ladies and gentlemen now we've got to ask ourselves two subsequent questions. Sometimes you only need to ask one question, but I'm going to phrase it every time in such a way that you have to ask both questions. So those import duties, does it have any effect 
on the condition of the plant. If you could tell for me yes or no, does it have any effect on the condition of the plant? Does it change the plant itself? Quite correct. No, 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 no. There you all go. Everyone who type say no, you are all correct. It doesn't change the condition of the plant. And now we're getting a little bit uh, concerned. Maybe it's not a directly attributable cause. But remember, there's still a further question that we've got to ask. Sometimes it's not so not so easy to get the answer, but I'm pretty sure you'll figure it out. The second question that we now need to, or the third actually, we've asked whether it's necessary, which is. Then we ask whether it changes the condition, which we said no. So now we're going to ask the third question. Does it have an effect? Does it change the location of the asset? What would you say, yes or no? Yes, you see, you are, I knew you would get the answer immediately. Fantastic, you all. There's one that had a little bit of a slip up. But yes, it does. I know it's not so obvious. But remember what I said a few minutes ago. If you import it, it's going to, once once it's offloaded from, from the aircraft or from the ship, it's going to land in the warehouse belonging to the customs officials, right? So it's stuck there, and you cannot move it to your premises. Remember this plant, you cannot use it as management intends. In other words, you cannot use it to produce your products if it's sitting in the customs warehouse. You have to first be, you have to be able to get it to your factory. Does that make sense? Does it make sense? You have to get it to your factory in order to be able to use it to manufacture products, which is what management intends here. Thank you, Zandile. Yes, so it does actually play a role in the location of the asset. If you don't pay the import duties, it's going to remain there in the Customs warehouse, right? Forever, <laughs> or until they send it back, or, or use it themselves, or something. Uh, but you cannot move it to your premises unless you pay. So it does have an effect on the location of the asset. So that means it does qualify as a directly attributable cost, and you are going to capitalize as part of the cost of the asset. You're not going to expense it you're not going to write it off uh, as an expense okay happy with that uh, ladies and gents now then let's, let's look at the installation cost and so now it has been we, we've, we've retrieved it from the 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 customs warehouse we have transported it we'll, we'll talk about transport soon but anyway let's maybe talk about the installation cost first should that be written off as an expense or should that be capitalized as part of the cost of the asset? We know it is not part of the purchase price, so it means we have to determine whether it is a directly attributable cost or not. So how do we go about doing that? Again, we have to ask ourselves three questions. So let's start with the very first question. Is it a necessary cost? If you can type for me there, yes or no. Can we do without it or must we incur it? Is it necessary? Yes, Tulile. Yes, Nkubile. Yes, Ngiza. Yes, Taryn. Yes, you are all correct, right? It is a necessary cost. If you do not install it, like I said earlier, I've actually seen this happen when you've got a, a loose and unbalanced uh, machine like the washing machine and starts its spinning cycle and it's not steady, then it starts walking <laughs> It starts moving about, right? So you have to install it. Okay, so it is a necessary cost. But we've still got to ask maybe at least one further question, or sometimes two. Let's maybe ask it in such a way again that we have to ask both questions. So the installation cost, does it have any effect on the location of the asset? Does it the installation make a difference to where the asset is? Yes or no? Quite correct, Zandile. No, it doesn't actually, because you've already you've already got it in your in your in your factory now. But remember, it cannot work unless you've installed it. So it makes no difference to the to the location. But then we have to ask the second or the third question in this case: Does it have an effect on the condition of the plant? Yes or no? 
on the condition does it make it workable yes 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 it does make it workable because if you do not install it it is not in a condition to manufacture products which means it cannot be used as management intents so even though it doesn't have an effect on the location it does have an effect on the condition now it make, makes that plant workable you can use it to manufacture your product right so therefore again it does qualify as a directly attributable cost which means that your installation cost is going to be capitalized as part of the cost of the asset and not written off as an experience okay all happy so far let's go to the next one fuel let me just highlight the whole sentence fuel for transport to factory what is what this means is they they had to go and fetch the plant from the they're importing it so they had to go and fetch it uh, from the, the the airport or from the from the seaport the harbor uh, from the customs warehouse they have to transport it all the way to their factory right and in that process they had to incur fuel for the trucks you know these these abnormal load kind of trucks that they are, they are uh, transporting this this uh, plant and machine plant on so again we've got to decide should this be written off as an expense or should this be capitalized as part of the cost of the asset we already know it's not part of the purchase price and now we've got to decide is this a directly attributable cost again we've got to go through that process and ask us ourselves a few ourselves as accountants a few questions the first question that we have to ask you all know that by now already is it a necessary cost yes or no yes 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 there we come with all the yeses thank you Zandile, Naomi, Lani, to oh, so many of you bradley kobile thank you it is a necessary cost you you cannot transport it to your premises where it's going to be used in the manufacturing process unless you get it there so now we've got to go and ask the second two questions like i say you possibly only need to ask one of them but we're going to do it in such an order that you have to ask both so that fuel uh, for transfer to the factory does that have any effect on the condition of the plant yes or no quite correct naomi valile tulile thank you all no it doesn't change the condition of that but now that's not the only question now we've got to go to the third one does it change the location of that plot yes or no yes 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 solani it does because you are transporting it right so yes it does it changes the location the place where it's at now it's not in the in in in, in the warehouse at the port belonging to the uh, customs officials now you can take it to your premises your factory where you can use it as management intents in other words the manufacturing process so therefore it does qualify as a directly attributable cost which means you are going to capitalize it as part of the cost of the asset and you are not going to write it off as an expense all happy so far okay let's go to the next one administrative cost administrative cost now again we've got to decide should this be capitalized as part of the cost of the asset or not we know it's not part of the purchase price but possibly it is or it could be part of the directly attributable cost so again we go through the the same process the first question we ask ourselves is is it a necessary cost the administration in other words uh, uh, ordering it you know sending faxes or sending emails to order it uh, doing the, the 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 electronic funds transfers to pay for yes it is necessary 
Mkubile, you way ahead of us. You, 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 you answered our next question already. Everyone, yes, it is probably a necessary expense. So it could possibly be a, a, a directly attributable cost. But now we've got to go and ask the other two questions. Would that administration cost, would it have any effect on the condition of the asset itself? No, thank you, Zandile. Every, thank you, Naomi. Everyone who wrote said no, you quite, it has no effect. It doesn't change the condition of the asset. And then we can also ask the next question, does that administration cost, does it change the location of the asset? Also, no. Thank you, Zandile, to Lile, Zandile, Nomi, Taryn. So it has no effect on either the condition nor the, the uh, location of the asset. So in that case, the administrative cost does not qualify as a directly attributable cost. So that means it is going to, to be written off as an expense and it is not going to be capitalized as part of the cost of the asset. Let's go and have a look at the next one. So they're very happy that they acquired this new plant. So they have a big staff party, staff party to celebrate the new plant. So the question again is, should this be capitalized as part of the cost of the asset or should it be written off as an expense? So we're going to ask those same questions for ourselves. Firstly, is it a necessary cost? Can you do without it? You can do without it, so you're all correct. You say no, you are all correct. It's not a necessary cost. But no, exactly, all the no's are yes, you're correct. It's not a necessary cost, but you can actually do without that staff party. The staff party is a nice to have. It is a luxury, but it's not a necessity. You know, strangely enough, um, I'm, I'm just going to mention it for your amusement. Strangely enough, a few years ago, there was once one lady student, but she always had something additional to say, which I find very, very attractive in any case. So she, she said, but sir, to keep the staff happy and to keep the, the, the staff relations good, I would say it is a necessary cost. <laughs> and I said, okay, let's go with your, with, your, with your argument, which is not correct because it isn't a necessary cost, but let's say you deem it to be a necessary cost. Then you still have to ask the next two questions. So that staff party, if you say it's necessary, which it's not, but if you say it is so, maybe it is for, for the good human relations within the company. Does it change the condition of the plant if you have that party, yes or no? Exactly, Valile. No, exactly, Zulani, Nkubile. It doesn't change the condition of the asset itself. Does it change the location of the asset? Yes or no? All no, right. Thank you all. So it doesn't change the condition, nor does it change the, the, the location of the asset. So even if you had incorrectly decided it's necessary, it is still not going to be a directly attributable cost. So in either case, you are going to write it off as an expense and you're not going to capitalize it as part of the cost of the asset. I hope you all understand that. So let's go to the next one. Ooh, I see we've only got about six minutes. Let's go to the next one. Staff training. So they are training the staff in, uh, uh, to, to, to use the, 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 the new plant, right? So staff training. So we must now decide should that be a directly attributable cost or not. So let's maybe ask, we go through the same procedure. We ask our first question, is it a necessary cost? Yes or no? To leave you way ahead of me, you are correct. You've already answered my question. I guess you've already read through the textbook. Um, let me just see what's happening here in front of me. I've got a little pop-up, but it doesn't involve us. So what were we talking about now? The staff training, the staff training. So is it a necessary cost? It is, uh, it's a little bit of, of a contentious one. I personally would say it might be necessary. I understand your reasoning in I, I can get that you say no, 
But, you know, there is the possibility that you've got this new plant, and if you do not train the staff, then they won't be able to operate the plant. In my opinion, I would say, yes, it probably is a necessary cost. You must train them to be able to use it. But remember, now we've got to go and ask the subsequent questions. Let's ask them the, the first subsequent question. The fact that you are training the staff, is that going to change the location of the asset? Yes or no? There you all have it correct. Zandile, Zulani, Muyisi. It is not going to change the location of the asset. Right. You are training the staff, but that has no effect on where the asset is. So now let's go and ask the second question. Does it change the condition of the asset? Yes or no? The fact that you've, tra that you've trained the staff, does it? Exactly. You're all correct. Zandile, Taren, Tulile, Sitimbe, Sitimbele, all correct, right? It doesn't change the condition of the asset. Sometimes I make a little joke here and I say, it does change the staff, <laughs> if you know what I'm saying, right? So the staff has changed. They, they now have got more skills. They know, know how to use this new asset. But remember, we are talking not about the staff uh, that gets changed. We're talking about the asset itself. So it doesn't change the condition of the plant, the asset itself, and it doesn't change the location of the, 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 uh, the plant itself. Right, so therefore, it will not as a directly attributable cost, it will be written off as an expense. Now, um, we'll have to be going through through the next ones a little bit quicker, unfortunately. I know that another class starts at one o'clock. Testing to ensure, um, I'm not going to go through the whole process now again. Testing to ensure the smooth working of the plant. Uh, perhaps we can just do this last one uh, in, in its entirety. The testing, if you incur cost to test the, the plant, is that a necessary cost? Can you use the plant if you don't even know whether it's going to work properly? So is it a necessary cost? Yes or no? Yes, you're all correct. It is a necessary cost. You cannot go ahead and start manufacturing products if you don't know when, when, when it is actually working. And now what you must also realize, ladies and gentlemen, if it's not working, if it is not producing the, 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 the product as it should be, those samples that you are producing, they are failures. They are epic fails, as you know how they say. They cannot be used. Then it means we have to go and adjust the plant. We've got to go and fix it. So we've got to amend and change the plant until such time as it actually works. Uh, so until such time as it actually produces the product that it's supposed to be producing there. You understand? So we have to adjust it. So now we've got to ask ourselves again the same few questions. Is it a necessary, a necessary uh, cost? Yes or no? Yes, 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 yes. It is a necessary cost. You cannot, you cannot go and produce the plant unless you know that it is working. And then the other two questions: Does it, does it have an effect? Does it change the location of the plant? Yes or no? No, you're quite right. You're right, Zandile, Zulani, Valile, everybody. It doesn't change the, the location. However, does it change the condition of the asset? Every time you adjust it to make it better, does it change the condition? Yes or no? Yes, 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 yes. All the yeses are correct, right? Because you are now changing its attributes. You are changing the condition so that it actually works eventually right so it does change the condition of the plant therefore it will be regarded as a directly attributable cost okay so let's maybe just have a, have a look at the the rest here they say proceeds from sale of samples produced during the testing now remember this is during the testing phase right during the testing phase so you weren't sure whether the plant is working correctly yet. So you are still tweaking and adjusting and going on to make sure that it is working properly. But then you see that the last number of samples that you have produced, they were actually perfect. They were perfect. So now you are able to sell it. 
So the proceeds from the sale of the samples that were produced during the testing, maybe ask you a credit. If it's proceeds from the sale of the samples, in other words, you were able to sell some of the samples, would that be a credit or a debit? The proceeds, which is now income, debit or credit? Yes, that for me, debit or credit. If it's now income, income would be credits. Remember, all your costs were debits, all the costs were debits, but now you are able to sell some of those prototypes. So the income will be a credit. But because this asset wasn't ready for use yet, it wasn't ready for use yet, you still have to apply that to the cost of the asset. But now because you have got incidental income here, a little bit of, of some of those last prototypes came out perfectly and you were able to sell them, you have to apply that to the cost of the asset, but would that now increase? or decrease the cost, that income that you generate by chance. Will it now increase the cost or decrease the cost? All the others were cost, but this is a little incidental income. Increase or decrease the cost? Decrease, correct, correct, all of you. Now, all the other costs were debits that you have incurred, but now you've managed to sell a few of those prototypes who happen to come out correctly. So that means it's a credit. So like you say, it's going to decrease the cost. So when you calculate the cost, that one will be a negative, right? You're going to show that as a, a minus. So it decreases the cost, right? So, uh, that was that one, the proceeds from sale of samples. Then maybe let's just quickly, I know we've run out of time, advertising of the new product. Ladies and gentlemen, if you go through the, 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 the same procedures, is it a necessary cost? Yes, it probably is, because if you don't advertise it, no one will know about it, right? But then we've got to ask the subsequent two questions, that advertising of the products, will it change the location of the plant? No, it won't. Will it change the condition of the plant itself, the asset? No, it will. Right. So therefore, the advertising, even though it may be necessary, it doesn't change either the condition or the location of the plant itself. So therefore, it will be written off as an expense and not capitalized as part of the cost of the asset. Then we've got this little item here, initial operating loss. Uh, that is a loss, so that is not a cost. Right. What it basically means is that initially you didn't have enough demand for, for the product because not many people knew about it. So you were running at a loss. You didn't generate as much income from it as your, 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 your uh, running expenses that you incur for it. But that is, uh, that is a result of the operations, right? So it's not actually a cost. So that doesn't even get considered whether it's part of your your, your cost of the asset because it's not a cost, it's, it's a result of income and expenses. And then the very last one, uh, the present value of eventual dismantling cost of the asset. Uh, that is a little uh, section or a little component of the, the definition of the cost on its own. So that's not part of the purchase price. It's not a directly attributable cost, but in the case of PPE, we've got that third category where it says that if you have certain, you are sure about it, you are positive that you have to incur it, if you have certain future costs, like in this case, the present value of the eventual dismantling cost of the plant, so for some reason, they will have to go and demolish or de dismantle that plant in the future. They know in accordance with an agreement, they will have to do it, and they can, uh, uh, they ca they can fairly, accurately determine what the cost is going to be, then it must be capitalized as part of the cost of this asset, right? Okay, and then uh, I've got the solution at the bottom. It is uh, it is part of the, the, the document that is on Blackboard. So you'll see there the items that we have capitalized, the items that indicate null uh, are the ones that we've written off as an expenses, the proceeds you'll see will decrease the, the actual cost. So there we've got the little solution. So it is there.
But the main thing is now you know the method or the reasoning or the logic that we have to go through uh, in order to determine whether it should be uh, capitalized as part of the cost or not. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're five minutes out of time. I've actually always booked this uh, uh, session until quarter past because I know we tend to run over time. So if you've got another class now, please just apologize to that lecturer saying Mr. Van Rensburg kept us over time as usual. So um, sorry about that. Uh, those of you who want to leave now you to go to another class, you're more than welcome. But let's maybe just ask whether there are any questions from your side. Mrs. Moore has got a hand raised. Is there something Mrs. Moore wants to add? Or would you like to type it there? Any questions from your side, students? You're most welcome to ask it in person. Or type a little question there. Okay, then please do not forget, just my last but very important message for the day, please do not forget that the class test, class test number one, uh, is is uh, tomorrow, right? Tomorrow, Tuesday, the 18th of, of August. So the class test starts at, at, at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. As you know, uh, the class test, we've, we've discussed this a few weeks ago, there's no paper that you get uh, beforehand like you did with, uh, there's no written test part like you do with a formal test. Next week, the 25th, next week, Tuesday, when you write formal test one, there will be a paper that will be presented again. But the class test, uh, you just get the, the questions in front of you. So you, there's nothing you write beforehand. You go straight to the online test. The questions are asked. You answer the questions. Right. And as we said uh, a week or so ago, there will be uh, uh, individual papers. It comes, the, the questions come from a randomized pool of questions. So no two students will get exactly the same paper. The, the, there will be various questions, but they are all of the same standard. Okay, that's all from my side. Molabeng, uh, Mashklari, you, oh, you, you've typed something. Let me just go and have a look. So please uh, upload the recorded session on Blackboard for PPE. Uh, yes, we will do that. Uh, just be reminded that uh, we, we, we're cutting off now about 10 past one, but it takes about uh, it takes about 30 minutes to be processed on Blackboard. From the minute we stop the recording until it's ready for me to download, it takes about 13 minutes. And then for me to upload it, I haven't got that quick internet, for me to upload it takes about an hour and a half from when I start uploading it to when it, it, it's finished uploaded is about an hour and a half. Uh, so, so I guess it, you should be able to see and view it by one o'clock, two o'clock. Let's say, let's say 3.30, more or less 3.30. It should be there. Any other questions, ladies and gents? Anything that um, Mr. Borman or Mrs. Moore wants to add? Okay, then I'm going to stop the recording. Uh, the next class for this week will not be in the full-time slot. It will be in the part-time slot. So our next full-time uh, class will again be next week, Monday, unless we we uh, notify you. Otherwise, I've seen there was an email about timetable, possible timetable changes. So uh, I, haven't, I haven't had time to look at that yet. But uh, if it doesn't change, it will be it will be um, next week Monday 11 o'clock again. Noni is tomorrow's last is based on the conceptual framework airway. Yes, it is. It is based on the conceptual framework. Uh, the formal test the week after that next week Wednesday will be on IAS one and the actual practical application the drawing up of the financial statements. But tomorrow's last test CF or conceptual framework. Thank you, Mr. Van Reesberg. We enjoyed your class. It was a very good class. Thank you, students. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Thank Cheers. You.